uh, Saturday, January 23rd. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I see I have Chief Jones and Josh. Yep. Um, so I would imagine Josh is go is coming on for the chief. Yeah, Bruce Ryan must be here somewhere too. He is. Bruce he is, is here. here. I'm here. Oh, there he is. There he Good is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So who would you like to do, who would you like to do first? Well, according to the agenda, it's the police department. Okay. Uh, Patrick, I I want to start with your capital, and then we'll go from there. Um. Chris, somehow, what did you do, Chris? I'm bringing up the budget. Oh, all right. Um, does everybody need for him to do that? I well, people, 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 people who are watching me. Right. All right. Yeah. It's just difficult for me to see everybody now. <laughs> so if I don't see your hands up, <clears throat> and I just disappear, we'll shout. I think. We'll shout. Yeah, you will I can disappear only probably. See, uh, four people right now. All right, go ahead, Patrick. So, um, starting with the capital, if you look at on your screen, it would be line 44, uh, TPD administrative vehicles, which is two. And then I can speak just in general about the, uh, the vehicles because that's the first three lines administrative vehicles, two, TPD police cruisers, SUVs, three and TPD Animal Control Vehicle 1. Um, as you know, um, with the purchase of police vehicles, it, it's kind of a, uh, a routine thing with the fiscal budget. Last year, under we didn't receive any capital expenses. The last time that we did receive police vehicles was we were fortunate enough to get the USDA grant, which we were able to purchase three Ford Explorer SUVs. Um, and that's how we also were able to purchase the senior bus. Um, but this past or the current fiscal year, we did not receive any police cruisers. And then the year prior, which was my first year as police chief, we received one. So in a total of three fiscal cycles, we received three, three police vehicles, four, excuse me, one and four. Um, I broke down the odometers, I sent it to the town administrator of the current fleet of police vehicles. So to start with and to keep with the agenda and to keep with the line item, the administrative vehicles. That, those are vehicles that are used by your detective division. They are non-police rated vehicles. So they're not per se responding to the emergencies like a police cruiser is, but they are still utilized by the detective unit. And on occasion they do respond to emergencies. The last time that we replaced any administrative vehicles was under Chief Blakey. So on the odometer sheet with those police vehicles, they are 2007s. Um, they're approximately 15 years old. And we have a host of issues with them because they're 15 years old. Um, they sit a lot of the times, the detectives rotate them and they use them. And they, they're coming to the point that even our mechanics looking at them, that they're not so much an issue with the mileage as they are because they're 15 years old, it's structural integrity and rot. So this request here is to purchase two administrative vehicles for $45,000. We I've priced them out under the master price agreement. The average price of a police, a non-emergency rated police vehicle would, would be about between 22 dollars and $23,000. That would include, because these vehicles still need sirens, they still need to upfit for radios, not as, in, as intensive as a police cruiser, but still the same. Um, and the current fleet of police vehicles that we use administratively, we're going to, at this point, we're just going to get rid of them because they're not even utilized. And I would say to pass them down to another agency, we, we don't even want to do that because they're just that old. Um, the next line would be police vehicles. We've had a lot of cruisers, excuse me. We've had a lot of success with the Ford Explorers and the SUVs. I'm sure you've seen them around town. Uh, they can get to areas that we normally wouldn't get to with a normal police vehicle. Also, given that they're SUVs, 
there's a more comfort level for the officer. We carry a lot of equipment in there. They, they're a lot more room and they're prolific, meaning that Ford has come back into the police vehicle market with their SUVs. So we've had a lot of success with them. The average price to upfit a 20, and we got lucky when we bought the 2018s because they were leftovers. So we were able to save some money when we purchased with the grant. I can tell you that I'm always looking to find a leftover to save some money, but this allocation, I have to anticipate that we're going to be looking at buying 2020s or 2021s. And with the way our budget is structured, and that's no fault of anyone's, by the time it gets authorized in May, a lot of the police vehicles have already been accounted for or purchased. So we have to get, so I am putting a little more money in there for the purchase of the vehicle and also the upfit. And because these three SUVs will be replacing three Dodge Chargers, there is no way I could use any existing equipment. We have to buy all brand new. So everything that's going into the vehicle is going to be brand new. And I will say that going forward, when we're purchasing new vehicles because of the life that we're getting out of them, which is approximately five years or greater, we should be doing brand new upfits anyway, because by the time that we're purchasing a new replacement vehicle, everything that we put into it is already outdated. Finally, the last one under- hey, Wait a minute, um, stop for one second, Patrick. Sure. So you're asking for three SUVs? That's correct. And the request is $50,000? No, oh. the request is 165. They're approximately 50. Uh, I see yeah. it, all right. Yeah. So I didn't get, um, I don't, did everybody get the mileage? Yeah, it came yesterday, um, <clears throat> Denise. So you should have an email. Yeah, I'm looking at from it. Chris at about uh, nine o'clock last night. Nope, I don't have it, but that's okay. I can I'll look. forward it to you. Um, Patrick, the only thing that, um, and this is just my opinion, there's no way we're going to buy you three. Um, everybody has a lot of requests and I can't see three. <laughs> uh, maybe two, so, but I, I was hoping that maybe you could get another grant. So funny you mentioned that. So, and I'm just doing some quick calculations here. My total request for police vehicles are with the two admins, the three SUVs and the one animal control vehicle. And really quickly, the one animal control vehicle that was purchased under Chief Blakey shortly after my father left the police department. And I don't have to speak, you know, my father retired, he's now deceased and that vehicle is still in use. So um, granted it is only used by one person. Um, it's, a, it's got 156,000 miles on it. It's a Ford Ranger. We'd be looking for something that does not have to be brand new for our animal control officer. It's used. We'd be looking for a pickup truck with a cap, which is why I put $20,000 just so we could upfit it. So it, and again, it does not have to be brand new. Um, and if we find something that's a little more functional, I can assure you that she, our animal control officer, will use that vehicle to the end of her career. Um, but to address the council president's concern, and, and rightly so, my total request for vehicles is $230,000. Yep. <laughs> so <clears throat> with that, and I know, Madam President, in the past, when we would do the budget, we were able to utilize monies that come in from us charging people and vendors who utilize yep. police vehicles in town. Yep. Under DOT standards, we charge $20 an hour for a police vehicle. So when you see the police vehicles, out there in the town on a detail at the national grid or the tree service, we're charging $20, $20 per hour. To date, uh, uh, since July, we have received $40,000 in monies from police vehicles being utilized. What so I'm do asking- know, Do you ahead, know what the actual detail um, account has in it right now? Last I checked, it was $40,000. That's it? We, yeah, that's we, it. We spent it last year. We, we spent it the year before to offset the amount of money to purchase the three vehicles with the grant. Right, right. Okay. So um, I have another grant for the same amount of money. So of the 230, and the, the, the grant is $61,000 under the USDA. So all total, if you were to authorize me to utilize the monies that are coming in, on a day-to-day -day basis to purchase police vehicles and maintain police vehicles, because that's what we're charging these vendors for anyway. 
and to supplement with the grant of the $230,000, conservatively right now, I have $100,000. Mm -hmm. So we would all but cut that request in half. And as we continue with details, that number is going to grow. Yep. So I'm coming in with the request for, if you, if you allow me to get the grant, utilize the money that we have coming in, now I'm asking for about $130,000. Which, um, so which I'm not unrealistic saying uh, the police cruises should be two and then um, we'll authorize, because this is what we've been doing in the past, by the way, whoever's not familiar with it. We take that detail account because it's the use of the vehicles and we appropriately spend it to buy new cars. Um, which I think is, um, which is being very fiscally responsible. So if, if we look at this, then you're actually only asking for the budget to include two SUVs. So with that- Right, yeah. right Patrick? I'm sorry? So if you look at this, the way I'm looking at it, we have $100,000 in that account well with the grant oh, yeah. with the Correct. grant yes so if we put you down to two suvs buy the third one with the detail money you following me i am i'm still with you man so if we put so the two suvs will cost 130. <laughs> so to be if i may I would much rather lose an administrative vehicle than lose an SUV. Well, no, we're not going to lose it. No, no, I understand, but I still need the three SUVs. Right. So you still get the three SUVs. Okay. It's, so I think, Denise, you're saying now use what's in that account plus the USDA money for one of them or for right. two of them. Yeah, for one of them. For one of them. And then the other two, then if you look at it, and I'm just doing a quick math here. So if you look at the police cruises and, and you turn that into two, that be, that line item um, becomes 130, correct? Okay. Okay. But we authorize you to buy another SUV with the grant and the detail money. Okay. And then the administrative... Um, vehicles of $45,000 will still have that in the detail account and the grant, correct? So this is the rub when it comes to utilizing the USDA grant. And this is the same problem that we had the last time. Yeah. Remember, it's the buying power. It's a 35% match. So the greater of number of appropriation from the town will meet that match. So we just have to make sure, because that was how we were able to get the senior bus. Right. When we appropriated $125,000 and we used the detail money, and it was $125,000 for police cruisers, you can't get three police cruisers for $125,000. But we were able to utilize the 35% match of the town's appropriation. And that gave us the $60,000 back. And that's how we got the senior bus. But won't that work the same way now if we do it this way? It would, but we just have to be careful because we're gonna to have to make sure that we are appropriating the amount so we can get the full 35% from USDA. Right. So they will match up to 35%. And if it's a, and exactly like we did the last time, we're gonna get $61,500. That's the max that they can give us. Right. So we so just have to make sure that we appropriate you... the max knowing that we're not gonna spend it. We're not going to spend it on our side because USDA is going to give it, give it to us back. Right. So if you think about it, if the two police cruises would be our match of 130000 if they more than our match. Are you following me? Can I, can I ask a question, Madam President? Sure. So, Chief, that yeah. would be only if, if we just, and I think what you're saying Madam President, is for us to, at some meeting in the near future, authorize the chief to purchase that one vehicle 
using a combination of the USDA and the detail money? Is that accurate? Yep. Okay. So, but Chief, you need okay. us to be able to show that match when you do that. That's correct. correct. So if, if we're, if our budget isn't authorized for next year, you technically can't show that match. Correct. So but if we, what if we say in that whatever authorization, assuming we do it, we authorize expending uh, the 65% of the money from the detail account, which should be, well, we may not have quite enough. The, the match on 65 is about just under 23,000. Correct. Right. So we'd, we'd authorize you to spend the rest of that from town money, whether it's detail, you know, let's detail money, and that would meet your match requirement for that car? The, the, the match requirement is, and just quick, if you do quick numbers, of 230,000, 35% of that is mm -hmm. 65,000. Okay. So it's just a hair over what our match would be. So when you apply, you have to apply for the whole amount? Correct. Ah, okay. Okay. So, and I understand what the president's saying, and, and I completely understand. I just don't want, to, I want to have the bigger number to get the maximum amount of grant re reimbursement. Knowing that, and I understand how it looks, we're not going to spend the maximum amount. Right. No, I get it. it it's, it's not, you can't piecemeal it out. Right. Okay. 35% so of 230 is 80,500. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. the other issue that we got to resolve here at some point, it's um, while we used to use these um, detail monies as the chief is alluding to, and it, and it was a very good practice. There's a, recently that the, those funds are no longer available for him to utilize that way. The, um, they're basically just set aside. And I don't know if they go to the general fund chief. No, they don't. So no, um, they don't. That is a restricted account. So <clears throat> it just takes council approval to do this then? Yes, we did it. We've done it. This is like, Pat, I think this is like the third year we've done this, actually. Right. I mean, and I remember, Madam President, sitting with you my first year, and we bought, that's how we bought the one. Right. Okay. Um, but, and this is coming from the treasurer, and I'm sure she can explain it better than I can. I know she can. So what was happening was, Initially, we were taking that detail money and putting it into our auto account. So in years past, the auto account at the end of the fiscal year, because we would, it would be a carryover, an auto would be plus three, four hundred percent. So the auditors came in and said, you can't do this. You can't have an account, a line item account, and then inject money into it from another source and then roll it over. So we broke it out. But by breaking it out, it, it's, it, it doesn't always get you, it's, it's broken out as revenue because it is. But what we need to do is have your authority or a resolution in the budget to be able to utilize it specifically for the upkeep, maintenance and purchase of police vehicles. So when we get to our, um, and there, we will be doing it hopefully shortly, um, the the fee structure that the town has, that the town council has to authorize every year. This is one of those items that we really need to look at and put um, some language to the revenue that comes in is restricted for police uh, vehicle use uh, uh, replacement. So it's, it, it is restricted. I believe the monies are restricted. I just don't know how he accesses it without your approval. So if, if your mm -hmm. opinion is that all you need to do is just let the treasurer know it's okay for him to spend it, that's fine. But I think that all these $20 an hour to come in should go in a restricted fund for this particular purpose. So that you're using assets to generate revenue in town, but then the asset gets wasted. And you can't replace it because he doesn't have the money. So it doesn't make sense to do this. I, my understanding is we did do that. Okay. We, I just want to make sure. Uh, I guess we're going to have, because we've gotten, we've done this for the last few years. Okay. 
Um, and my understanding is we could do that unless things have changed and things change daily. And um, I do know there was a complaint about this, um, but I thought that we resolved it. Um, but we'll, we'll talk to the treasurer. Okay. Um, we'll have to come back to this, but, no, that's fine. Um, but I think if we have the money sitting there, um, I think we, it's best to use it so that we don't have to tax. tax I would totally it. agree. And that's what, and, and when we discovered, well, it wasn't that we discovered this money. What we did was we, we looked at all the reserve count, accounts at the time. And this, this account was really building. And we said, well, we need to spend this money instead of taxing people for new cruises when we have this money available to us. And, and it, it puts a level of control with the council too. So right. And it worked out very well. And people were not taxed for these cruises. We were able to use this money that had been sitting there um, that we really didn't utilize. Okay. So I think if we look at it, um, I think we'll come back to this. Okay. But I really do think that we can um, pull something out of this and use that money. Um, and especially, and thank you once again, Patrick, for looking at grants. We rely on you for doing that. And um, we have recognized that you do do that. So I think if we use the grant and the detail account and can figure out how to do that, then we can pull some of these vehicles off and buy these vehicles with that money. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. I just have a question. Go yeah. ahead, Donna. I, can you, um, was, did, did you say I could speak? Yes, yes, Donna. Oh, okay. Um, I, um, I kind of put this in the category, maybe I'm wrong, because it's detail money, but it's still um, revenue. Um, that the monies for uh, the, the billing for the fire department goes into the general fund. And we've always asked if we could buy vehicles with, you know, 300 and 150 or $300,000 to replace the rescue vehicles uh, was never permitted. Um, how is this different? So there's, we charge two fees. I'm not sure, uh, Counselor, if you mean the administrative fees. So for the police department, I'll speak for the police department. We charge every detail, every police officer that works and is getting paid by the detail company. Let's take the, like the casino, National Grid. We charge $3 an hour in administrative fee. That comes back to the town in revenue. So the, the police officer gets paid from the vendor plus $3 an hour and plus FICA, which is 7.65%. And that's on the vendor and they pay us that back. So that comes in as revenue. The police vehicle, which is on the side of the road running with the lights on, if, whether it's one vehicle, two vehicles, we charge a DOT standard rate, which is $20 an hour. No. So there's two separate okay. fees. Uh, oh, I, um, may I call you Patrick? Of course. Okay. Um, Patrick, I, I do, I do get that. What I guess what I'm trying to marry or understand as in the past, I have asked repeatedly why the monies for the uh, third party billing uh, is not put in a restricted account to just buy rescue vehicles. And it's never been permitted. I always told it has to go into the general fund. You're not allowed to do that. And I'm just trying to figure out why it's so different. I don't have a problem with, with using these little uh, bucket accounts, uh, I'll call it, to, to be able to you know, use it towards grants uh, and, and to buy vehicles. And in the end, it's, it's a very, very good use of money uh, to buy things. I just don't know why we don't do it for the fire department. I, I'm not getting it. Uh, yeah. And I obviously it's I can't speak loud, it. it's not sure will, But I agree with you, ma'am, because I mean, my purchases of vehicle is still significant because it's fifty thousand dollars for a police car. But when you're buying a, a rescue or an engine, those are quarter million dollar to five hundred thousand dollar purchases. And if you're bringing money in through a rescue account or a third party billing. Uh, I would say that, and I, I agree with you. 
um, as a citizen and it, that it just makes sense that you don't finance a vehicle for half a million dollars and pay interest on it where you can buy it in cash. Um, but that would be obviously a conversation with the fire chief. But from what we're doing here, it's kind of a smaller macro level or a micro level of doing what you're proposing to do for the fire department. And I would agree with you. Yeah. And, and Donna, it um, looks like Denise got um, I, kicked off. Are you all set, Donna, with your question? Oh, um, well, uh, it, it also, the, the same thing that um, the police chief is trying to do um, could also be done uh, for the fire department, which we're not on yet, but also with the fire department, uh, those monies that you use for rescue should be used to buy chest compressors and, and soul monitor defibrillators. Um, anyway, it's maybe we can discuss that after. And I don't know how that would be done because I've always been told no. Yeah, and certainly I think it's open for discussion. I, I don't think any of us who are newer to the council have an understanding of why that difference might be there. That might be good reason. So I'm going to shift to Deb, if that's okay, Donna, if you're done. I am. Thank you. Okay. And You're welcome. I, I, and I have to say, I totally agree with Donna, and I really would like to look at that further for the fire department. Um, but my qu I have two questions. If we totally pull off from the budget one police cruiser, is it okay for the grant if it doesn't show in our actual budget the actual monies that we're looking? Like, do they look at our budget? They do. So or do I, we leave I, it in there and just say it's going to be paid from that grant? So I would have to check and get back to you on that. But I know that they do look at the budget and I have to submit all of the paperwork. It has to be actually authorized by you and by the budget committee and by the voters. So it, they want all of this information. Okay. So it keeps municipalities and, and grantees honest. So they're not just saying, here, look, we're allocating this amount of money. Give us our full allocation for reimbursement. And then they don't spend it. So they're very, very particular, as you can imagine, about the grant process. So I would have to check because I just want to be able to, whatever that number is, our maximum reimbursement amount is $61,500, which is exactly what we got the last time. So I want to make sure whatever allocation that we put for police vehicles gets us back the maximum reimbursement. Okay. And maybe that's a question for Denise Surrett too, as it, how it looks on paper. Um, have you actually applied chief for this? Yes. Okay. And, and, we, are, we, and we know yeah. we have it. Awesome. So, so then I, um, I have another wait, question. Hang on, hang on. Deb, go ahead. So in the past we've done resolutions and I think we took them out. I, I'd have to go back and look for last year because last year, the COVID year, it was a very different year, but I believe that we had resolutions from the budget committee that passed to take a certain amount of money left over from one year into the next year for a capital fund, because what our goal was, was to build a capital bucket as Donna would call it, to have some money there, especially if there were an emergency and we, you know, we wrecked a police cruiser or a rescue and we needed to buy something quickly with, uh, and having cash and being able to bargain a little bit better because we had cash up front and not have to buy it under a five year plan. Do we still have that bucket and can we use that for anything? Um, so I think that's probably May a I question speak? for Chris. Donna, hang on. Chris had his hand up, and I think that's a question that Chris can answer so, best. And then I'll go to we, you, Donna. To answer a couple of questions, um, yes, we still have the bucket of money. That's exactly where we took the money from when the when the police server and fire server crashed this year that we had to replace. I yeah. came to the council for an emergency purpose to utilize those funds. In the past, there's been part of that money was, I guess, Jan had decided to put it in the budget as an appropriation with a revenue stream, matching revenue stream to, to show uh, clarity as to you know where these expenditures are coming from. I'm not necessarily so sure that you need to do that as long as it's approved by the council um, and that all those expenditures that come out of those accounts should be approved by the council because they are restricted funds. They're not revenue funds that the budget committee really has access to for their budgeting purposes. Uh, so the council should look at Rebudgeting those. We did not put that in the budget this year because we had no idea where we were going to be. 
Right, exactly. Um, to, to answer the other question about whether or not you have to show it in appropriation for a grant purpose, I know specifically because I've done this uh, in the past with uh, with the um, with BGA monies, uh, with the Attorney General's office and others that um, as long as you make a commitment to make the match, they don't care where the money comes from because he, the chief could have forfeiture monies that wouldn't be in the budget at all. And he could utilize those monies to match. There could be uh, uh, FDA monies or social security monies that come in for specific purposes that could be allowed for matching purposes that would not be in the budget anywhere. So it, you know, he'll, he'll seek approval from the grantee agency, the grantor agency as to uh, this is what he wants to do. This is how I plan on matching it. It may not show in a general revenue tax budget, but it may be in other uh, restricted funds that he has access to and permission to use for the match. Okay. Thank you, Thank Denise. You. Um, Thank you. Donna was Donna had a question. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know if Christopher ans answered this. Maybe he did, but Deb, if you look on page two, capital improvements, you will see at the bottom second from the bottom is called capital reserve carry forward. And there's $150,000 in there. So um, I think that's what you're talking about. I, I that, think. Is, that is, that is Donna, yeah. yes. And, yes. Yeah, so, and the other thing is that we're not talking about is, I don't know how much money is in the, uh, what do you call, gaming account. And we're not allowed to touch that for a whole year, I think, until we know it's there. But there must've been something in there. No, I, no, I can answer both those questions a little bit. The 150,000 was just, I put that as a placeholder for discussion purposes to bring up the very same issue that Deb is bringing up and that you're bringing up, Donna, now. Um, I know there was like 155 or 150, whatever the number was that was there when we took the 10,000 for the server, would have to have that deducted. But there's also gonna be, after the auditors are done for looking at FY 2020, Whatever the reserve amounts were in uh, monies that were like, brought back to the general fund, there'll be a percentage that will be added to this particular account. I don't know what that number is right now because we don't have the audit, but once we have it, we'll give, definitely give you an update as to what that number really is so that you can make better decisions moving forward as to what you want to do with capital. That's, so that's why I put that number on the sheet. I wanted to, to disclose to you that we, you know, some of these, we, I know we have a lot of capital requests, and I know that you know monies are very, very tight and you may not want to spend all the money that you have in reserve monies and restricted accounts for capital, but I wanted to use this as a placeholder for this discussion so that you can make appropriate decisions of you know what it is you actually do want to allow to be spent. Yeah. So th that number will be updated after the audit comes out as well. Donna, to yeah. your other question, the casino money, I believe there's going to be about 300000 over there. Right now. Uh, Right, yeah, that's so, what we're for the year right now. Right. Year so year if year. if you well, notice my agenda item for Monday, um, yeah. I did put it on there to address it because that has a ending of May, and um, I I want to um address that and um keep that as a restricted. This is my opinion, uh, but I have that's a discussion for Monday actually. Yeah, we, we can't really discuss it now because I have my own thoughts on that anyway. But um, I just, um, uh, I mean, we, we could use different purchases for that. But any, uh, we need to move on because we really can't talk about that. So it, it will be another funding source that you're going to have at your disposal. You're just going to need to decide when you get there. That's all. So I just want to make sure yeah. everything's on the table. Let's. I'm All right. I'm not sure where we are because believe it or not, guys, my computer decided to do an update in the middle of this meeting. <laughs> this has become so, the worst week of my life, to tell you the truth. So, so Madam President, um, Donna had the last question. And then if I could ask a question. Sure. We're still on capital okay. for the police department. Um, just quickly, Chief, of the other items, what are your highest priorities? So um, the highest priorities of vehicles. Yeah, so, of, the, of the rest of that, what are your highest priorities? So the next one, as a matter of fact, the next one, and I'll do it like, if you don't mind, Mr. Vice President, I'll just do a brief overview of the remaining capitals, and then if you have any questions. The next one, the uh, telephone recording system, um, and the President will remember this. Before COVID hit, 
So as many agencies in town, Cox came in and they upgraded all of our phones. So we went from an analog system to an IP system. They did town hall, fire department, they, uh, school. So with us, we record all of our telephone communications, all of them. Because the telephone recorder that we have is an analog system, it didn't marry. So I had grant sources to purchase an upgrade. It was authorized by the council. COVID hit and they pulled my grant money. So, and it's been now almost a year that we have not been able to transition to the new Cox telephone system. And I think we're the, one of the only remaining agencies in town. So I was able to talk with Cox and talk with our telephone recording folks. They gave us a discount because it was gonna be $15,000. They cut it in half for us and Cox also helped us out. So now that price of 7304 is the price to upgrade our system so we can move on to Cox uh, Telephone. So aside from the vehicles, that's the next thing that we really need. So we can purchase and kind of move forward with that because we are moving forward with it as we speak. Cox is coming in, replacing all of our telephones so we can integrate with the rest of the town. Um, the last uh, three, the Surface Pro laptops really quickly, these are the laptops that exist inside the police cars. Some of them were purchased all, over a decade ago. Some of them still have Windows systems that, um, because they communicate directly with state police, when a police officer runs a listing, runs a registration, runs a, a check on a person, that communicates via cellular, secure cellular connection to state police to get that data back. So that computer has to be of a certain standard that we have encryption software and Windows security. Because the computers are aging out and are at end of life, there's only so many Windows updates that window will allow them to, to have. So we need to start transitioning those systems out. Uh, the next one is the server redundancy. And I know all of you are familiar with, as the administrator was saying, we're building out our infrastructure. Um, what we've done and there's also plans because we have an actual server environmentally controlled room here at the police department. We also maintain police and fire here through a remote secure connection. What this request would do is on top of the server that you just authorized for us to purchase, which is working well, to purchase a redundancy system. So in the event something were to happen, we have a backup that is seamless that we can switch to. Um, and possibly also, and I'll let the administrator explain this too, maybe bring other agencies in town, entities in town onto our secure network, separated of course, but still make like a, hub, a central hub for IT. And so, then, go ahead, sir. So to, to, me, to emphasize that point, this, this week the server went down in this building and it actually wasn't the service fault. The battery backup system to it um, failed and it, all the computers in town hall went down and it took us a while to get everything restored. We were down for about a half a day. Had it been in the IT system over at the police department where there is a uh, controlled environment, air, you know, temperature controlled and a backup generator to it, we wouldn't have had this issue. So we have a lot of disparate systems around town. Many more, you know, the battery backup system for the town hall was 15 years old. It, it, you know, everything is so antiquated. There needs to be a full look at how these systems run, and they can run from one 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 area and be piped out uh, uh, securely uh, under today's modern environment uh, and, and run much better than what we have been doing. Mm -hmm. So we do need to look at that whole process for the entire town, so that we don't wind up losing some critical data and everything is in a, in a controlled environment and where there's um, redundancy and where there's backup generation. Uh, so that's, you know, I, it is a problem in town. The other thing is we're trying to get, um, well, everybody's running on Cox here in, in, in the town. We really need to get a fiber connection to the police department because he is going to be confronted with very quickly. Uh, and as it's on the state's general assembly budget this year, to modernize all police department uh, recording systems, not, not uh, phone recording, they're like um, all their records management systems so that every town can communicate to one another. In order to do that, they all have to be on fiber connections to do that. 
uh, because the bandwidth that we currently have through Cox Cable will not sustain what he will need to do. Uh, and it's, it will be a statewide initiative, mm -hmm. but every city and town needs to be on a fiber connection, which he doesn't have at the moment. So would that be similar to an electronic medical record? So an electronic police Very record? Very similar to that. When um, a few years back, um, there's, a, there's an entity in the state called Ocean, and they have um, fiber connections to most law enforcement agencies, uh, but it started with medical, all hospitals and all libraries. And it was through some initiatives that the state police and the attorney general's office did years ago to make sure that the state police could communicate properly. And the attorney general who had the, um, the criminal records management system to make sure that they could also communicate properly. We got fiber connections to them. And the issue is that when you get on with them, we, we had Verizon before that. And our Verizon connection to the building uh, had a, uh, was in the, um, the sewer connection pipes and all that, they were in, the, in, in South Main Street, it blew up. We were up and running in 10 minutes because they have multiple uh, connectors that they utilize and multiple service providers as redundancy so that you do not go down. Uh, and when you're trying to pipe your information across, we piped all of our information up to Andover Mass as a redundancy, just to make sure that when, if something ever did happen, that we would be able to, you know, go to another building and turn on and be seamless. We wouldn't have any you know, issues of not being able to operate. So we're trying to get the police and fire at least to be that way. And ultimately that our tax collections and treasurer's office that have pertinent data need to be in the same kind of environment. And you, we're not there yet. We've got a long way to go. Uh, we're at the very infancy of looking at where we need to be. But it's the cost of running a business today. I mean, we've got a $50 million enterprise and we're running on, you know, you know, Staples computers. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just not at all feasible to continue running this way. But it's like everything else. We have to, you know, slowly work our way through a, um, an evaluation and put, put together a thoughtful process of migrating to a much <coughs> system. So Denise, Patrick was just finishing up and um, you must have got booted off again, so you're back. Shit, I don't see her. Oh yeah, she's back. Your mic's off, Denise, your mic's off. I'm back. I just learned how to override uh, the update. I'm pretty <laughs> proud of myself. Um, all right, so Patrick, I'm gonna ask as I did last year for all the department heads to prioritize their capital one through whatever um, and get that to us because when we actually do votes on the capital, that's very handy for us to know what your, your absolute priorities are. So I know your number one priority is vehicles, but then if you wanna go down the list and prioritize it that way. Does that sound fair? Of course. Okay. If I if I may, just the last thing I just want to address that public safety communications study that five thousand dollars, just and I know you all are aware, but just so you are aware, um, and the fire chief can speak about this one too. This is involving radios. This was on our last capital budget, but obviously given you know the issues with capital, right now the police department and the fire department, but the police department's main channel is an eight hundred megahertz si system that's maintained by the state. And the fire department operates off a 400 megahertz system that's maintained by the town. That's, we own it. So the 800 megahertz system and the consoles, which are the main dispatches, not the portable radios police officers carry and not the radios in the cars, the one, the consoles at the police department were given to us in 2004 by North Providence for free. But as you can imagine, they are 16 years old. We've been told by the vendor through the state that they are end of life, that we need to upgrade them. This is going to be a major purchase for the town that we need to start talking about. Because when we purchase portables for police officers and firefighters, mobile radios that go into apparatus, police cars and fire trucks, and consoles that go into the police department and the fire departments, this purchase could easily go over three quarters of a million to a million dollars, easily. That's what we've been told. So before we just go out and start spending money that we don't have, and it's a major purchase, this $5,000 is to put a committee together with members of the council, public safety, to see grant opportunities so we can 
look at what we're going to need to do and maybe even stage it out over years, like, like prioritizing, like, the, you know, Madam President, you were saying, with the radio communications in town. So mm -hmm. that is what that money is for. All right, thank you. Um, do any other counselors have any um, questions regarding uh, the police department's capital before I move on to the general account? Jay has, Jay, Jay has a question and Bill. Uh, let me take my lower hand here. Uh, Chief, good morning. Good morning, sir. <laughs> Public safety communications. Last, uh, last budget cycle, you requested $94,000 and a lot of that was supported by a grant, which we discussed at length. So why is that not part of this year? And would that, is that grant still uh, in effect? So to answer your uh, last question first, yes, the grant is still in effect, but in speaking with Motorola, um, that what we were going to utilize that money last year for is to buy the fire department portables because with respect, and again, the chief can speak to this, they're in worse shape when it comes to radio communications than we are because we're on the statewide network. They're working with portables that we got rid of, that we gave to them because we switched to the statewide network. So in speaking to the state and speaking to Motorola, which is the authorized state vendor, they told us, you might not want to piecemeal this. Because if you're just going to buy portables to go onto an old system, you might want to put, pump the brakes a little bit and do this, you know, a, a, on a, a bigger level before you're wasting money on equipment that in a couple of years is going to be obsolete already. So that's why we stopped and kind of pulled back. So we're not wasting money and we can have an approach that's going to be cost effective and also the best for us going forward. Because like the administrator was saying about IT, we're constantly chasing technology. And a lot of the technology we have, people throw away and we're still utilizing it. So, which is why it's going to be such a constant investment. So, and given what we've been told at the status of our radio system, this is not a, it's not even a hundred thousand dollar purchase. It's a half, three quarters of a million dollar purchase. We felt, felt it was best to stop and then go forward in a, in, at baby steps. So you, you forego that and we'll do the study and get the really bad news. Correct. I'm working on and, getting the study for free, by the way, too. So and and not buying like I do at home. I have a little problem with a computer. I buy this and then I buy that and I buy that and I still end up having to buy a whole new computing system. We don't want to buy an iPhone seven when they're releasing the ten. And that's kind of where we are. <laughs> Okay, and then as you explained about police vehicles, I fully understand that you can't you can't use the accessories to fit in one vehicle and just transfer them to another, maybe the roof rack and stuff like that. But so when you you're gonna keep obviously the 2016 vehicles and they're still gonna be frontline vehicles. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you do with the equipment? Let's say you get rid of a vehicle that has the equipment in it. Uh, it's everybody understands that uh, odometer miles just apply. I call them chassis miles. They're not engine miles. So you you you've got a vehicle that's that's exceeded one of those two concepts. What do you do with that equipment? Can you sell it, or is it just going to bin somewhere? So and I know you've all been to the police department. If you go to the back of the police department, um, we're blessed with having the mechanic that we have. Um, he's really good at being a, because we just don't take all of that old equipment offline. We might take one car or two cars. And as you know, you know when it comes to buying administrative vehicles, we don't routinely do that. The, the chore, if you will, is always about buying frontline vehicles. Those are vehicles that are striped with bar lights and they go on the road and they respond to emergencies, which is kind of why we're in the situation that we are now with all these secondary administrative vehicles that have high mileage or they don't have high mileage, but they're 15 years old and they have other structural deficiencies. So we, we have police cars in the back that we've taken offline and put back online 
So we can utilize them in secondary functions. We also have police cars in the back that we cannibalize for parts. So we'll take some of the old bar lights, the old frames from inside the car that hold the radio systems, and we'll keep them for emergencies so we can keep our fleet running because things break. Um, and the older they are, obviously, the more they break. So, and it's harder to get a rack for a 2011 Ford F-150 that's nine years old. We're going on eBay to find this stuff. So we're keeping a, a good portion of spare parts here, not only for inside the car, but outside the car as well. And one last question. Are any of these new vehicles you're looking for going to be hybrid? Um, possibly. I know that there is, um, when it comes to the, the, especially with Ford, it depends on what model year we're able to get. If you re recall, we got lucky with the 2018s because they were left over and they were just outside the hybrid models that came 2019, 2020, 2021. So given the discount that we were given on the 2018s, we scooped them up. Going forward, I don't know how fortunate we will be. We might be forced to buy hybrids because that's all they have left. So, but that's definitely something that we look into. I'm also, to be, to, you know, to also be frank, we have the Dodges still. So because police vehicles are in such demand, they, we were told even with these three 2018s, if you guys don't buy them, we're going to sell them somewhere else because there's a waiting list. So it could be you authorize me to buy two, three Ford SUVs. I can't find them. So I might have to go and look and get a Dodge or get something else so we can have the cars because we're, we're put on a waiting list. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Bill. Hi, Chief. Good morning. So we're not locked into SUVs. Um, we're locked into the 165 figure. I guess my, I don't have a problem with the IT question, but SUVs versus cars, I know you kind of explained the difference and why you're preferring an SUV, but because you're looking for so much, I'm just wondering if the car the three cars would be a little bit cheaper to purchase and to maintain over the long run. Surprisingly, the cars, the difference between the cars and the SUV is not much of a difference. And with the Ford product, um, they only make the SUVs now. So they've totally switched their philosophy to go to SUVs. And if you look, and I'm sure we, as we all do, and as we're driving around, it, they're prolific. You, you see more SUV police vehicles than you see standard police vehicles. Um, so, and the other issue that I have too, because we right now we have a mixed fleet. We have Dodge Charger police vehicles and Ford SUVs. If we continue to mix, now we're running different tires, different parts. So we have to be careful. So the, the move to switch to Ford SUVs was a move because of the benefits that we have. And also, I would also say that with the, when it comes to the cruisers and the SUVs, we're not chasing people traditionally as we have in the past. We don't need a fast car. We need a durable, reliable, get to the call type of car, which is why, as you see with most law enforcement agencies, they switch to the SUV. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Anyone else have any other questions from the council for the chief on capital? Okay, then we'll go to the general fund annual budget for the police department. So just to, to keep this simple for- uh, I, I, have a, I have one question. Go ahead, Donna. Go ahead, Donna. Does, does the chief need permission to apply? For, does, yeah. does the chief need permission to, to apply for the grant? I uh, know I don't believe so, but um, does anyone else have a comment about that? He needs to notify us he's he's applying and what he received. So ultimately, but, um, oh, I, don't okay. I, I just okay. Ultimately, yeah. the council would have to weigh in and approve any kind of grant right. that get that gets authorized. But as far as applying, I think it's really important that we encourage them to do so, and if they get it or 
they need, uh, sometimes they need the president's signature on it or they need other things. Um, then they'll come to the council and talk about it. So but, his, um, historically, every city and town gets some sort of burn JAG grant funds to come through. And then the chief would normally come to you and explain to you how he would like to expend it and you usually authorize it. Yes. So right now, like Chief Chief Ramos is going through a safer grant process. Yes. Uh, and if, it, you know, he, we'll, we'll look at any grant we can find and apply. And if we get it, we'll actually have to come to you to get authorization and move forward with it. Right. And I don't want to um, delay the process of them applying. I want to encourage for them to apply because if they have to come to us every time they're about ready to apply, it'll be cumbersome for us and it might be a delay. So um, and for them, not only us. So um, yeah, eventually we will learn about the grant. We will we'll learn about matching, but I encourage every department head to go forward and then come to us when it's um, when they need us. All right, Donna. Donna, are you all set? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Go yep. ahead. Go ahead, um, Patrick. So um, as. The first portion of this budget from my line item is the salaries going all the way down to um, sick leave buyback. All of this is, these are operational numbers for salary. Most, if not all of these, probably with the exception of overtime, are contractual items. Um, this is the all the AFSCME employees, which start at the records clerk first and go down, um, are numbers that uh, represent a 2% increase for AFSCME for their salaries. And that's a contractual obligation because they are in the last year of their contract. Everything for the police officers, which is from the school resource officer salaries going up, uh, do not represent an increase because they're in a, it's at the end of the contract year. Their contract will expire on June 30. So we are going to begin the administrator and, and obviously members of the council would begin contract negotiations with the IBPO to discuss salary and, uh, and other issues. And just to let everybody know, we're in the process of scheduling that now and probably we'll begin next week or the week after in that. Okay. So, and then going on to other increases. Um, so one thing that I did break out um, is, if you go down a little bit more, sir, any particular copy line? printer lease on a line 81. So that was a new one. So what I'll do is just everything, everything is going to be level funded with the exception of the ones that I'll break out and, and explain to you. Um, the copy lease is what we've done historically in the past. We have four major copy printer machines in the police department. They're faxes, they're copy machines. We've purchased them outright. We've purchased them used. Um, and when they're used, they usually come to us with 50, 70, 100,000 copies on them. Um, and then we're buying toner to maintain them. And as you can imagine, we, we print a lot of paper here. Um, and we do scan and we do our best to not do as much, but we still do. So by having these machines and buying them outright, we do get them at a discounted rate but we're responsible for all the upkeep and maintenance of them. So I've spoken to the administrator, I've spoken to other town departments, the library, the school department, town hall, they lease through a master price agreement with the state. And that through the master price agreement, they, we get a brand new machine, brand new. It is completely warranted and covered and covers all of the toner, which as you can imagine, even when you're buying a off the market or go to Staples to buy a toner, the toner costs more than the machine when you originally purchased it. So this request would be to lease four brand new copy machines. And the only thing that we would have to do is put paper in them. And I'm leasing them for five years. So it's getting the lowest price um, and, they're, and they're completely covered and warrantied. And then after the five years, we would get brand new machines. So that is what that $7,500 is for. So Chief, can, can you articulate I know it wouldn't be an issue. Oh, you would wind up buying them this year because they you have a number of them that are pretty pretty tough. But your annual maintenance on what you were doing and what you were you know the cost of buying these old used machines ultimately winds up to be the same thing every year if you Correct. spread it out at the same time. 
And you're, so, get, you're getting better, newer machines. Correct. And that we're also doing, which was kind of counterintuitive, is we would buy, um, for example, the uniform division, which is where all your police officers work and where they print. If you go into uniform division, all of the individual officers, the lieutenant, the sergeant, they had printers in there, even though they was, they were were their office is eight feet away from the printer because the printer wouldn't work. So they'd have a backup printer that we would buy, and those are two or three hundred dollars. Plus, we would put hundreds of dollars worth of toner into those machines to keep them going once they ran out. With this plan, we eliminate all those secondary machines because they don't need them. They have a reliable machine that they can network into. And again, it's eight feet from their office. It's not like it's another, another part of the building. So the plan is to get rid of all of the HP machines that sit on people's desks and act as backup and have one main central reliable machine that the officers can use and they utilize it 24 hours a day. And the only thing we have to do is put paper in it. That's it. Madam President? Yes. Um, question, Chief, for you, and then I think for Chris. Um, is there, you said five years, is there a maximum number of mileage on it, number of copies? Um, <clears throat> there are for certain machines, there are. Yeah. I'd have to double check what that is, but even, uh, and obviously it's, you pay more based on if they're color copies opposed to black and white. Um, and for, I'd be looking at getting, they don't, you know, we don't need color. We just need black and white. Or if we had one color machine, we you know, designate it in a certain location. They do need fax capabilities, yeah. um, but it'd be faxed to email because yeah. the, the machines that we have now can't do that, but these machines would be able to. So with all of those technologies, I'd have to double check, sir, on a specific number. That's and, okay. I just, and over that. Whatever machine had the, uh, the amount, but to your point, we can't even tell that because the machines that we're utilizing now, if you would have asked me, you know, how many, you know, what is your busiest machine? I couldn't even tell you yeah. because the machine comes in with a hundred thousand copies already. Yeah. yeah. And you had talked about the individual printers and offices. I know that um, when we went to uh, group machines like that, um, we did the same, but um, over time, eventually individual machines creep back in that also had to be maintained. So just making sure that it was clear that, okay, you're not, if you bring something else in, that's your own thing. And, you know, we're not going to worry about that. Um, but Chris, my question is, is this, and maybe from a master price agreement, it doesn't make sense um, st standpoint. Have we, and you may not know this, and maybe Denise does, um, ever looked at having the town do one lease for all of the uh, printing needs for the town. Um, and also um, this to me is an area that would be right for collaboration with the school department. Um, this and possibly some IT pieces um, with the school department to be able to reduce cost over time. So I, I'm not quite, are you saying like do a central copy center? No, yeah. no, a central lease. So uh, for the town, let's say there's 20 copy machines across town for, the, for, for just town government, not the schools. It sounds like the chief is doing his lease. Maybe you have, you know, a lease for the, somebody has a lease for your office. Maybe there's one for so we, the clerk's so we, office. I don't know. Okay, so I, I follow what you're saying now. So I know like the fire department has, uh, they have a copy as, they have some that may be on the master price agreement. And these are all leased. Like the one here in my office, it, we own it outright. It's, it, we, we're going to, until it dies, we're going to continue using it and maintain it. Um, but as we, we see others that go through that process, ultimately the cheapest way to keep them running is to use the state's master price agreement. Yeah. And, we, and they're all through core in each province. That's where they're the ones who actually okay. have the majority of it. So, and I believe the schools are doing the same thing, that they're on okay. the same master price agreement. So okay. it, it is a master lease. It's, yeah. they, they're using the state's MPA to get the yeah. best reduced rate possible. Um, and there's only one vendor on that MPA for- No, there are multiple ones, but I okay. think four has the majority of them because okay. they have the better machines throughout the, okay. uh, that last longer. I've been through it with a number of other, other vendors and some of the machines aren't as good as what they, you know, the savins that come out. Um, you know, it, 
ultimately over time, you, you can figure it out which ones are beneficial that work and have, they have very little problems with them. So it's, the other ones, you can have the service guy here every week trying to deal with jams and other things. So, yep. okay. um, it, but either way, they're all still on a reduced price that the state negotiates and we, we try to maximize that to the best that we can. Great, thanks. And I will say that, you know, I did the, we had the same issue in my office about the small little printers. If you teach people how to utilize them so that you can actually print and hold print, you know, to get 50 people using one printer, they learn how to do a whole print function. I would do my printing all day long and then go out when nobody was there and just start printing my stuff out. Hmm. It's when it gets, you know, you're, you're co-mingling stuff with other people, it can be really difficult, but they don't, they, they never learn how to use the machine properly so that they can have their stuff and have it segregated from everything else. Yep. So it's a, it's a learning curve and core does that. They'll come in and teach the staff how to utilize the machine to its maximum advantage. Thank you. Anyone else with questions? At this point, um, let's talk about the overtime. You did increase it by 10,000. Patrick, am I right? No. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at this, and there are some changes. This is not the uh, the updated one um, that I was submitted, but the overtime remained unchanged. So the overtime is going to remain at 160. 170. That's what we currently have. You were oh, no, okay. It's 20, yeah. So. But if you look at the approved is 160. That was, that was for 2019. Yeah. We're in FY 2021 now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 I wish we weren't, but. Um... So this, this is the January 15th. Uh, I see. It. I'm just, um, yeah, I'm looking at two. I'm looking at the hard copy I have too. And I think so, I'm probably I am looking that. at this one and it is, I, there is an updated one, but the, and just to be efficient, the, the only increases that I asked for aside from salaries. So going into operations is the taser, taser assurance replacement program, education, medical, and auto. Those four accounts and the inclusion of the copy leaser lease account as a new account. But so in total five increases. Okay. And the Taser Assurance Replacement Program, that is, it, it went up from 19,410 to 21.6. Um, that is just the program that we pay. So every police officer has a Taser, they maintain it, it's warranty, kind of similar to what I was just saying about the lease program for the, uh, the copy machines. Education uh, <laughs> from 45,000 to 53,000, that's an $8,000 increase. The purpose behind that is Less officers are going to school for sure. Um, I don't. I hope that you know we, that we use that for training as well. But COVID really uh, put a dampener on everything. The reason for the increase this coming year is per the contract, I am required every two years to conduct internal promotional exams, whether we have an opening or not, and I have to conduct exams for sergeant, lieutenant, and captain. And we have an outside assessment center that comes in, and it's all the eligible candidates, but it's $2,500 per rank per test. Not per individual, but the whole test. So, and that's about $7,500. And then that list is good for two years. Yes, sir. Uh, Chief, so, <laughs> so whether you have an opening or not, they in their infinite wisdom have basically instituted a practice test. It, it's, <laughs> I mean, if you look at it that way. So th there is logic behind it because by having an approved list, we can put a supervisor into place immediately. The next person on the list knows. And with a lot of the retirements that we've had, with a lot of the, the, the movement that we've had, by having and maintaining a list, because before the list was only good for a year. So we were, we were conducting tests all the time. So we have to have a test, but now it's good for two years. So they've doubled the time that the eligibility okay. is on, the, on the, uh, for the test. And we've changed the process. So this process, 
what we would do in the past is we would buy tests individually for a cap and they were generic. These tests, they're through Roger Williams University. They come in and they've constructed a Tiverton police sergeant, Tiverton police lieutenant, Tiverton police captain test. So when our officers take the test, it's all rules and regs, our town ordinances, our policies and procedures. So that it's not some aftermarket captain test or lieutenant test. It is a test that they should know these things to get promoted. Okay, so that's not so bad. So now you as the police chief have, you can look and say, okay, I've got this opening. I've got th these people that have taken and passed that exam. Now I just have to pick one instead so, of having to wait. In and that was also process. part of the last negotiations before it was the person who scored the overall cumulative score the highest with, I had no choice, but I had to pick that person. So the number one person was seniority with how they performed on the test, how they performed on an interview. Now with the change to the IPPO contract, I get my pick of the top three individuals on the list. Oh, really? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> And of course, we, but the only other problem with it is yet another stand, state mandate that is unsupported by the state. <laughs> it isn't, but, and I can understand your concern. I won't call it frustration. Um, even with accreditation standards, this is why we changed the test too and we do this investment into the test. So we extended the test list for two years, whether we have an opening or not. It makes all of your police officers study. And they're not studying books that are, you know, from Amazon or that, you know, they're never going to open again. They're going to open up the town ordinances, the policies and procedures, state law to prepare themselves for a test to be on a list. And that position might not come open, but I'm a huge advocate of getting our police officers to know what they should know, whether they're getting promoted or not. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, Donna. I have a question regarding the accreditation stipend. Um, I, th I thought we, that was a one-time thing. Was it already paid or is it not paid yet? We're not accredited, are we? So we are not accredited, but fingers crossed, Wednesday we are getting assessed, this coming Wednesday. As a matter of fact, there's a public um, comment section that's going to be open to the community to talk about it because Wednesday should be our day. And to address your other concern, the accreditation stipend per both contracts, IBPO and AFSCME, is a yearly stipend of $500. Right, up until this time, because we have a new contract. It is open for discussion with the IBPO, but it is part of the AFSCME contract. Yeah, I know. So it's a flat five hundred dollars per officer. Is that a person? Oh wait a minute, wait a minute. Who's talking? Um, Donna is still talking. Go ahead, Donna. I'm a little confused. I uh, maybe I need some clarification. I was under the impression that the accreditation accreditation uh, stipend was a one-time payment uh, for the police to be accredited to national standards, if I'm correct on that. Um, and I, I didn't know it to be, to be yearly. It's in the contract per year. I'm present. Yes, Mike. So Donna, and I wasn't here obviously, but I think what you're describing is the fee that was paid to the accrediting body that any accrediting body charges to the, for the agency to be accredited. This is a salary stipend, salary based stipend, or not even based. It sounds like it's a, a flat um, increase um, for each person once you become accredited. Is that accurate, Chief? Yes. Yeah, so I thought it was supposed to be a one time. So it's line 5120 is was actually what Don is talking about. Yeah. Account 5120. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Donna. Wasn't that, wasn't that supposed to be a one-time payment? Like, thanks for helping us get accredited. It's turning, it's yearly now? So it, 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 
it's thanks for helping us get accredited and maintaining accreditation. So that increase, because what ended up happening is the IBPO was in negotiations at the time. So every police officer gets a $500 yearly stipend every year of the contract. AFSCME, the police employees, and then the budget was set. AFSCME was still in negotiations. They piggybacked for police employees also to get the $500, which is what, and that stipend was not included in the budget. So I was, I needed to transfer money in to cover the AFSCME employees who received the benefit after the contract was signed and after the budget was approved. So this request to covers all of your police employees to include IBPO and AFSCME, but it is a $500 yearly stipend. Donner, I think what you're talking about, um, I think you're, I think you're right that it was while they were getting accreditation um, and we didn't know how long it was going to take. We put it in as a yearly, but it's something to keep in mind that is negotiable once the police contract comes up, which is going to be now. And when Ask Me comes up and usually Ask Me follows what we did with the police contract with this accreditation. Patrick's right. Once we gave this to the police, right. Ask Me asked for it. Yeah. Um, but this is all negotiable. Um, ASME's coming up soon, aren't they, Chris? Yeah, Next year, maybe? Next year. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of hard because they all run into each other, depending on how long it takes to get it done. But I mean, I think this is a negotiable topic for the next contract. And, and if I can, I will say that, and I understand, you again, you're concerned about this. We have, we have been trying to get accredited for 10 years. Oh yeah. We have, during my tenure as chief, and we've had some staffing issues, we're getting accredited. And I can say this publicly, Wednesday, we did it in 14 months. Not that the $500 stipend to our employees made the difference. Our employees made the difference. This is just to maintain it, their reading policies and procedures. We've had more in-depth conversations about accreditation on a daily basis so we can get this accreditation and, and be recognized as a best practice police department. I understand that it, everything is up for negotiation, but if you look historically, and even in Rhode Island, police departments that get accredited, they give their employees stipends. Some are thousands of dollars. Others give time off, which I can say also publicly, I am not in favor of giving time off anymore. I would much rather see a monetary stipend given to our employees who assist with this and help us maintain this because it's beneficial not only for us, but for the town. So, so Chief, this still has to be maintained. It's not, once you get it, there, there's if a lot of work. If we lose accreditation, they lose the stipend. We won't, and I can tell you, as I said, we're not gonna lose accreditation. Now, and also keep in mind the giving time off, and we discussed this during negotiations, that is more costly because when these people have time off, these offices or dispatches, then we're paying overtime to replace them when they're off. Correct. So this so this was the most financially fiscally thing to do because we did talk about time off, if I remember. And it was just going to be a lot more costly than giving them the $500 stipend. This also, if you recall too, was part of the negotiations to move at least with IBPO because so they would pay the full co-share yep. of the HSA, mm. yep. which, oh, was yeah. the, which was the final $500. Yeah. So they pay the full co-share of the HSA, which is of the 2000, 4,000 split, the employee, pays the full $4,000. And to kind of marry the two issues together, support accreditation, and you're gonna pay the full $4,000, which was, this was a component to that. Well, yeah, it, everyone has to keep in mind that the contracts are very complicated mm -hmm. and it's a give and take. So sometimes it doesn't make sense unless you look at the whole contract and see what happened during the contract yep. and what the increases were for um, our employees and what the increases were for us. Mike? Just, Chief, 
<clears throat> by being accredited, does this help us kind of give us a leg up when we're applying for grants? Do they, especially if it's through like the Department of Justice, do they look more kindly on accredited agencies? So the short answer, yes. Um, it also reduces your liability insurance from, the just gonna say that. from $25,000, where it currently is for a deductible, to $2,500. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and, I was just going to say also, that. And also, if we get sued for any sort of allegation against the police department, our the trust who represents us, along with the solicitor, look very favorably and kindly that we are an accredited agency. And if we can show that we follow policies and procedures, it helps us defend these lawsuits. Right. Any other questions? All right, so of course we're going to, at, after reviewing the major departments, we will come back. Um, I did put on the agenda possible votes because I do that every time just in case, but we will come back and, um, and make some decisions on uh, whether or not we like everything that's been asked for, which is very rare, and we all know that. So um, thank you, Chief, for spending Saturday with us. Um, and if everybody's all right, we'll go to the fire department now. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chief. Chief. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I, I want to thank Bruce and jo Josh for um, bearing with us through this. I know it's been an hour and a half of it. No problem at all. Okay. No problem. So, Bruce, could you go over your cap? Oh, Donna? Donna? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say... Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was just wondering how long this meeting's going to be because it's taking up a whole morning. Can we, is there, um, maybe we shouldn't have took the two biggest one, maybe a big one and a small one today. I don't, I don't know. It's just- Well, like I said at the town council meeting, I was hoping to end it at 1130, 1130, 12 o'clock. I, I had every intention of, you know, of making this a morning. I don't know. It's kind of a big- um, Well, uh, let's try it. Let's, all right. let's try it. Um, because capital seems to be our biggest um, issue and Bruce has four. So it might not take as long. Um, go ahead, Bruce. Okay, so I, I have on my capital list, I have two. I know I have some um, additional- Oh yeah, you're right. There is two, you're right. Um, I do have some additional item, items in my operating, but um, so we'll, we'll just take it. I'll start with the capital. Um, the first one that I have for capital is the two Lucas chest compression um devices these are two devices um madam president like you know they're used for cpr when somebody's in cardiac arrest um these are two items that were approved in for this year's budget last year um they were taken when COVID hit obviously all the the capital items got taken away um understandably but that doesn't take away that, you know, we still need these, these items. Um, these are the, the items that I put in for the firehouse um, sub grant that I, we did not get this year or this time, this round, unfortunately. Um, again, we still need these. We do have one similar device that's, I don't know exact, but 10 to 12 years old. Um, it's very big, cumbersome. These Lucas machines do have been proven to do a much better job during CPR. Um, they're much smaller, much cumbers uh, less cumbersome. With the machine, the device that we have now, again, we only have one. It's carried on, um, it's placed on engine three as opposed to the rescues. Every time we use the one we have now, there's there's parts of it that are one-time use. Um, just the, the band, without getting in too much into exactly how it works, but the band that we have to use for each patient cost $125, $150 every time we use it. It's not like we can wash it and put it back on. Um, with the Lucas machines, everything is, you don't have those, those pieces that are just throw away. Um, 
you clean the whole machine and put it back in service. So, um, Captain Ferreira is my EMS director. Um, I, if he wants to add a little bit to the, exactly what these machines are, if you have if you have any questions as to what these machines are or what they do or why we need them, we can take it from there. Um, Chief Reimels, um, I, I have to tell the newcomers to this, um, we were very much in favor of this last year. Um, we were given, um, we were given the reasons why we needed it and everyone felt that um, we did need it. Um, like you said, there's only one available and it's old and it's not as effective with CPR. Um, I do support this line item, if anyone cares. Um, last year, we really felt that it was important. Any questions? Donna? Um, I feel that, um no question that when it comes to the very foundation of, of uh, stopping someone from passing away, um, that uh, I'd even be willing to vote for right now. The, the Lucas chest compressor, uh, no question. That's a, a first response, stopping someone from passing away um, needs to be, that just needs to be. Um, the Zoll monitor defibrillator, uh, that's, that's another one that, that um, isn't on this though. We bought, yeah, we bought that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so that's why it's there, but then it's not there. It's just, a yeah, short yeah, we already bought it. Oh, okay. Um, I was, I just thought, um, yeah, the, the Lucas chest compressor, I'd be willing to vote on that now that, that just has to be. Well, I think to be fair to all the department heads, I what I normally do is listen to all the capital requests so that everybody gets to um, to tell us why they need it. And mm -hmm. then we vote. What we did last time was vote at um, the capital in one meeting, just whatever um, we approved of. And just so we get to listen to everyone so it doesn't sound like we have priorities. Um, and I do agree that this is absolutely something that I, that we shouldn't argue. Um, Deb? I just wanted to comment, the budget committee wholeheartedly last year yeah. supported this. And unfortunately due to COVID, it was removed, but um, I agree with Donna, it's life-saving and we need that equipment. Um, and I agree, Denise, we need to kind of wait till everything's done, but um, um, I, I would support this too. All right, so let's talk about a fire truck. <laughs> Now this fire truck. You really is, want to talk about a fire no, truck? No, I really, I know. I've <laughs> talked about fire trucks for 15 years now. I know you have. Um, but this fire truck, this this is a yearly payment, correct? No. No, no. this. No. this the cool. 900 that I asked for would be, that's for the price of the, the well, truck. Well, thank God yeah. you said that because usually <laughs> this isn't the way it's presented. Um No. Right. So if we so if we pay this um, over so many years, this price would definitely come down. Absolutely. And we usually do it. I don't know if anyone I I can't remember right now. How many years do we end up um, paying for this over? Something like if, this would probably a minimal would be five. Yeah, yeah that's five. that's what I was thinking, too. So the actual this is actual just the full capital request, but it's not. It may not necessarily be what it will cost us this year. Right. We would still have to go out to bid, procure it, right. and then come up with some sort of lease agreement over time. Right. Well, it's a little. Ten years. But it, it, we would put it on some sort of lease payment because we don't right. have enough capital to pay for it immediately. Right. So what I want to, if any budget committee members are watching or the, the members of the public, our capital requests will come down because yeah. this will not be the full cap. This is not our capital request for this year. They're absolutely 100% okay. correct, Madam President, yeah. for sure. I always am. Well, I think <laughs> I always am. I know I'm not. <laughs> okay, so moving on, moving on. Um, yes, absolutely. That That is, so just to give you a little background, um, I put together a, a truck committee um, with some of the members of the department 
Um, again, Captain Ferrero um, took charge of that and talked to a few different manufacturers. Um, the 900,000, we don't have an actual invoice, obviously, or anything like that for 900. That is the median price we've gotten for the truck that the truck committee and myself um, absolutely think that, that this town needs. Um, usually fire engines, what we've historically done in the past is um, spread out the payments for 10 years and rescues for five years. So I want to give you a little background as to what I've, uh, and I'll just do the, I know we're strapped for time here. It's okay, just, Bruce. Just the fire engines, um, give you a little history of what we have here. We have currently have three engines in town, one for each um, district. The newest engine that we have is a 2013 um, with 46,000 miles on it. The next one is a 2011 with 164,000 miles on it. And the oldest one is a 2002 with 185,000 miles on it. So um, with that being said, just like Chief Jones, um, actually, I think Council Edwards alluded to this or stated this earlier, that you can't just go by mileage. You have to go by engine hours, wear and tear on the truck, et cetera. Um, there's an industry standard for the for fire apparatus. And what you do is you take the number 36 and you multiply that times the engine hours to come up with what I call the equivalent miles um, on, a, on a big, big truck, bigger truck, a big diesel truck, um, obviously like the fire engines are. So the engine, the fire engine that I would like to replace, I, I truly believe that we need to replace is obviously the 2002 with 185,000 miles on it. If you do the equivalent, the industry standard, it has 407,000 miles on it. And the next one, the 2011, is 375. When you do that math, it's 375. And these aren't exact numbers. I mean, I didn't round down to the exact number, but it, it you know, pretty darn close though. Um, so I would like to replace, I truly believe we need to replace the 2002. And I wouldn't actually just, we wouldn't be getting rid of the 2002. We have spent quite a bit of money in it for the past few years um, to keep it because we've had, we haven't had a choice. It's our first run engine for that district. Um, it's in good running condition now. It, it passed its pump test, which is an annual test that it has to pass. Um, that would be, moved into our reserve to the reserve, just like we have a reserve rescue. That would be our reserve engine. Right now we do not have a reserve engine, which puts us it kind of- It become a, a problem. It, sir, absolutely, without without a doubt. Um, what we do now, just, just to let everybody know, what we do now when, when we have an engine go down for uh, whatever mechanical or whatever reason it, it needs, it goes down is we take the tanker the tanker truck um which does have a pump on it and it does have obviously it's a it's the purpose of that truck is to carry water um a lot more water than a regular fire engine it does have a pump on it and it does have a whole one hose on it um we use that as our first run fire engine which is not i i can't come up with a an equivalent to something outside of the fire service, but it doesn't have the ladders on it that a fire engine done. It doesn't does it doesn't have all the equipment except for the hose and the water, basically. So it's not a very good backup fire engine for sure. It's a specialized, it's a specialty vehicle that we need. But doesn't have any support like Jaws of Life and uh, uh, no, and absolutely not. All the other stuff that you carry on a normal fire engine fire uh, pumper. That's right. It doesn't even have the air packs that we use to go into the buildings. We have to jam those into the small compartments that it has when we put that in as a first run uh, fire engine. So with that being said, the fire engine that I would like to purchase, I think we need 
Um, it's called a quint. A quint is a fire engine. It carries water, carries hooves, carry, carries all the equipment, and it does have a ladder on top. I know in the past, and Denise, I'm sure you can attest to this, you know, it's kind of been taboo to talk about or ask for um, a ladder truck. This is, I've heard so many things in the past, or oh, they're just trying to get more manpower. You can't run this without more manpower. Um, you know, it's a parade piece, et cetera. All not true. It's a, this is a fire engine with a ladder on top. We don't need more personnel to run it. We can run it with the amount of personnel that we have now. Although I think the personnel that we have now is a little short and I'll, I'll discuss that later. I'm not gonna be asking for personnel to run this piece. Absolutely not. This is just to replace what we have now. Um, All right, so if I did the math correctly and this is like, I'm rounding this off and I'm probably am not putting enough interest on this, but this line item, if we decide to do a 10 year lease, would come down to around $100,000. Right. And yeah. if we do a five year, of course it's 200. Right. Um, so just so everybody knows that and we make everyone aware that this is not really what this line item is. Right. This is not for this one year. I am not asking for not, yeah, the 900. Okay. Just yeah, 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 yeah. Just because obviously it makes our capital um, request looks less, which it definitely is. Um, so, all right, any, any questions? Yes, Jay. Well, <laughs> I see all of you. I see all of you. As during my four years on the budget committee and even before that, it always amazed me the resistance in town to having a fire department that had an engine with a ladder on it that that wasn't uh, something that you could buy at Home Depot and stretch up against the side of a two-story house and then expect a fully decked out fireman with a hose to go up there and fight a fire off of it. It just it boggles the imagination. So I'm glad to see that uh, Chief Rimel's and I've always thought a quint would be a great idea rather than a does nothing more than be a ladder and type engine. And anybody drives around town, you, you'll notice right off that our buildings are getting taller and they're in areas that they're not quite accessible from a lot, you know, just a, an extension ladder. So, yeah, I'm, I'm entirely in favor of, of this. It's, it's been a long time coming and it's been too long delayed. Donna? Um, okay. Um, I, I think we have to be mindful um, that yes, the town does need things, but you, you also have to be mindful that what can the taxpayer afford? And it, at some point, you're going to have to prioritize. And, and we are capable and have in the past um, that the fire, as opposed to rescue, um, the rescue was used far more than fire now because of the way uh, we have preventive uh, fire materials that we used in buildings. Uh, so it's really come down a lot. And we do borrow from Portsmouth and Fall River and surrounding areas to use a ladder truck. Um, so, uh, you know, we're really gonna have to really look at what people can afford. You, you, you can't tax people out of their homes. It, it just isn't gonna work. So uh, we really need to lose an eagle eye on, on what we can afford, uh, what's, what's doable. Uh, what do we have the, in the in the gaming revenue? Um, are there any grants around to buy a fire truck? I mean, has anyone looked at that? I, I just um, it, it it just really needs to be looked at. You, just very much so. Um, Mike, I see you here. Go ahead, Donna. I just wanted to know how much the interest was, and it, and if if we did decide to go forward with this, with paying cash, would the price come down? And also uh, how much would we save in interest? 
Of course it would, Donna, but I don't know if we have $900,000 laying around right now. So that's always been our problem. <laughs> I mean, we, no. we could always go for the five year and maybe put some money down. I'm sure we could do that and pay for some of this um, and then decrease what it's actually going to cost. But like I just said, I'm I'm not quite sure of what we have in our capital reserve, but yeah. I know that it's really not 100000 Really have to crunch the numbers, um, that's for sure. Um, Mike, I saw your hand, but Josh had his hand yep. up first, so yep. we're gonna, yep. I'm going to address Josh. Uh, Madam President, I think uh, one of the things is with a ladder truck or uh, with the Quint is um, speaking to some of these manufacturers that they said that I believe a price tag of 900000 they'd be able to finance for 15 years. I know you just said the opposite to keep the interest rate low, but I believe and I can get this information for both the chief and you, you uh, this body. Um, I believe it can be financed farther to 15 years, even if they want to try to lower payments more. Yeah, and I mean, I always, I'm very cautious to do too far out of a lease because it's costing us so much more money. Yes. So I, yes, I mean, that, we have course. to be, yeah, and, and we have to be practical in that way too. And like yep. I said, maybe we could look at the capital and put some more money down and lease less. Um, but that's that's for another day. And I am going to get the figures from the treasurer. Um, our audit, it won't be complete until the end of next week, but we'll have a better idea at the beginning of February what we actually have in all these capital accounts. Um, Deb, I'm going to ask Mike because he had his hand up before you. Fine. I can see everybody now, so <laughs> go ahead, Mike. So thank you, Madam President. And yeah, just very quickly, uh, Chief Rimals, I want to, um, I haven't had a chance to congratulate you on your appointment as chief and, and also recognize that you are one of I don't know if you remember, because it goes back about 20 years, uh, oh. one of the ambassadors to our family when we moved into town, so to speak, because you came to visit us twice within about a week. Um, the first night we were here, all of our smoke detectors went off and we didn't know the house and you calmed us down, especially my wife, um, a lot. And um, then a few days later, our daughter fell down our cellar stairs. So you came and checked her out and now she's a very healthy, almost, 26 year old. So congratulations mm -hmm. and thank you for that ambassadorship. Um, the other piece is more of a statement and, and Donna, I certainly, I think we appreciate the need to balance what we feel that uh, taxpayers can afford and, and what is necessary in town. I just uh, question or um, the logic around always thinking that we can rely on other communities through mutual aid agreements to come to our rescue when we need a ladder truck or some other type of device because those other communities likely have mutual aid agreements with multiple communities plus their own needs to take care of. And I mean, certainly if I had, you know, five neighbors who needed my ladder right now and they needed it right away for whatever reason, I can't give them all five ladders, the, my, my one ladder. I can only give it to one of them. Um, and, you know, certainly bigger communities like Fall River most likely have multiple ladder trucks, but still their priority is to their community, not to Tiverton. And unless we decided at some point to do a regional fire department, which I don't hear anything, anybody talking about, um, then it doesn't make sense for us to always be relying on those communities for mutual aid. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Josh, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. I think he's going to do a little show and tell. <laughs> oh, no, I don't, I don't I actually okay. don't have anything to show you guys, but um, I know the chief did want me to speak about what the truck committee has done to this point. Um, obviously, the chief Rimals approached us for getting ready to stop planning. So I reached out to many manufacturers yeah, of fire trucks. Um, um, sorry, I heard an echo. It messed me up. Uh, obviously, keeping in mind, we need to keep in mind the needs of the town, the needs of the department, but we're also trying to be fiscally responsible as well while we go through this process. Um, you know, we're not, I want every one of you guys to know that while we're looking at it, we're looking for functionality, we're looking for reliability, we're not looking to buy 
the most fancy bells and whistles type of truck that we can, you know, can buy. We're trying to buy what we believe will be the best for this town and operationally wise too. So I know before there was a comment made um, regarding tall buildings in town. You know, it's not even the tall buildings anymore. It's also the buildings that are set back farther from the road. You know, we have a lot of buildings, uh, you know, many mansions, McMansions in this town, Nanaquocket Road, some of these newer developments we have in town, um, they have big houses. You know, the tallest ladder we have on our ladder, on our engines are the 24 foot ground ladder. And, you know, it's a lot of these houses that get you to the gutter, but it won't get you, you know, to the roof. So it's, um, you know, obviously I feel that this, this quint is needed. And I think that, you know, it's, um, you know, the best piece of apparatus we could buy from the department as, you know, being a fire truck, but also having capabilities of like taller ladder for longer reach and taller buildings. So, I don't know if anybody has any specific questions for me about what we've done. Uh, Mr. Carter, I see your hand, sorry. But, well, yeah, I, know Deb, um, I know Deb's in front of me, so. Yeah, Deb. Deb's in front of <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't see everybody. Yeah, so I just that's see. okay. Deb, go ahead. And it's actually more of a comment. So I understand we spread out the, pay the payments by going more years, but to go to a 15 year, wouldn't that be the life of the truck? Yes. So, you know, now, now we're paying until the end and now we have to get another one. Like, I don't know. I just, I think if we can save a little bit on interest and go a little bit shorter, um, I, I just think that'd be. The life expectancy, I mean, obviously the life expectancy of this type of truck is about 20 years. So I do agree, but I just wanted to put that point out to you earlier just to give you other options when you're looking at that type of price tag. I do also want everybody to notice that we, and I think I'm right, we've paid off the rescue truck. Yes. So um, we're not paying on that lease now. Um, and well, we that was that was with cash. That that was right, Donna. I, I can't remember. Well, it was yep. with cash. Yeah. Yep. And we're not paying that now. Um, Chris. So Josh, while well, well, I have you here, I, there are a couple yep. things I, I want you to expound on, so that the council can get a full flavor of to what it is that you, you've been doing. A yep. the two thousand two fire pumper is definitely would need to be reserved. We need at least a pumper. So yes. a pumper still doesn't give you the tools in your toolbox to do the things that you need to do regularly. And I'm not saying we need three quints, but we need something. Can you tell exactly how that would be more beneficial a, for our staff, for our safety, yes. for the, you know, the benefit of the community? Because there's a lot more of this than just having a ladder. It's, you know, right. your, your functionality, the things that you do when you get to a scene also have a lot to play into this in trying to prov provide our staff safety and the safety of the residents as well. Right, so um, having a ladder on the roof obviously gives us more, uh, having a large ladder gives us more uh, capability as a fire department. But what it is, is right now, like you said, engine one, the, the 2002 is a truck that should go to reserve. Uh, it needs to go to reserve. The department is in need of a fire engine at least. So as me and the chief and the truck committee sat down and looked at this, uh, a quint fit better in this picture because buying an engine nowadays, we're looking anywhere from 575 to about 630 uh, for an engine. Buying a quint gives us the op opportunity to have a fire engine, but also that ladder truck component for um, that, we're, that we need in this town for Yes, more than the five seventy-five or six hundred thousand dollars, but it we're buying basically two trucks in one and making the most out of this one truck. You know, I know in years past it was always a ladder truck that we went in on, and it was always that ladder truck had one purpose. It was just a ladder. Um, it didn't have a pump. It didn't have a tank. So speaking with the chief, I believe that this this quint would go to replace that uh, 2002 Ferrara engine that we have. And what would happen is it would be able to serve as an engine in that district. You know, if, if there was a fire in that, in that district that it's in, 
they would be the first truck there. They can pull a hose. They can pull a lo- uh, pull a hose. They have water, the pump. They have multiple capabilities than just specific capabilities to just an engine, just a ladder. Uh, so even like a chimney fire or something like that, it's, yes. you know, it, there are some roofs yeah. that are so steep, even though you can get to them, you don't have the right. space for your staff to be actually be up on those peaks. Right. One of the one of the common misconceptions is that these ladder a ladder is for um, large buildings, tall buildings. I mean, a lot of this town is built. It's got steep steep roofs, the, you know, high pitches. It's got you know two story houses. Once you try to get on that roof, trying to climb up onto a roof that steep is not safe. Um, and then if you have a chimney that sticks over your roof line taller than a, a firefighter, so six feet, the capability to try to put that fire out, the capabilities to do that safely, it, it's impossible. I can't, we cannot put out a chimney fire that's taller than a firefighter standing on that roof. I mean, it's it's impossible one, and then also it's it's not safe for the so firefighters the, that are even on the roof. And the last misconception I want to clear up: um, I know that when we've talked about ladders before, we don't have a facility to put one in. Would a Quint fit in one of our facilities? Yes. So everything I've I've went around to all of our fire stations. I measured door heights, ba- uh, the length of the bays, the width, everything like that. Um, we are working. Any truck that we do buy will fit inside those constraints that we do have. So there's many companies out there and they build trucks for plenty of fire departments that um, have the same type, same type of restrictions with door height and engine bay length and all that stuff. So uh, I, know, I know one thing, question. Um, I know one thing is, you know, Mr. Carter, you asked one time about um, the, this truck setting up on hills and stuff like that. Um, we have had demo trucks down here as of recently, you know, maybe a month or two ago, and it very successfully set up on Hilton Street. You know, it's in its steepest part. Okay. So um, it would have that capabilities. I mean, we're trying to find that truck that will serve every call, everything there is. We're trying to plan for everything. Unfortunately, you know, we can plan for most. It's it's hard to plan for every specific situation. Okay, anyone else? Did I forget someone? Okay. Um, I, I, I just have a couple more things on this one item. Um, I'm not going to get into the buildings that are being built and all that stuff now. Um, Council Janet, the 15-year, like um, the captain said, this is this is more – this truck is going to be it's not a specialty truck it's i want to get that point across it's a fire engine it just costs a little bit more of course but it does it just has that capability of having a ladder on top but it is a, it's it's a fire engine it's a fire pumper it just has that ladder on top so yes this truck would last more than 15 years i don't expect it to be out of service in 15 years for sure um, Council Cook, I know you, um, talking to Chief Jones, you talked about, um, the money that the department brings in for certain things, obviously for the fire department, that would be mostly, that would be the re- rescue revenue. Um, certainly if we had, that's something we can discuss in the future. Um, that month, some of those monies can go towards, I think should go towards replacing fire apparatus. I do have the um talking about the principal or well, correction the, the interest paid so for our 2011 fire truck um we paid over the 10 year term for that we paid an extra $112,000 um because of the the interest rate the lease rate and the, the purchase price and for the 2013 we paid an extra $80,000 so any monies we can put that we don't have to um borrow obviously is you know that money will be that amount on the interest would be lower um and, and i'll just end with this with the, on this topic um like the captain said it's not just tall buildings my number one priority as the tivin fire chief is the safety of the residents and the and the members of this department and i truly truly believe that this 
piece of equipment is something that we need to, for me to allow my guys to work in, the, in an environment and put them in the environment that is the safest possible. Obviously what we do is not a, it's not a safe thing. Um, but I just, I want to, we've had instances before one on my, on my, um, watch, if you will, a few years back, one of my it, chimney fire, it was a single story. The chimney was, was like the captain alluded to was a lot higher than, you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't just get on the roof, look over and, and, and do what he had to do. He ended up falling off the roof. Um, broke his leg in multiple places. He was out for months, well over six months, I believe. We have surgeries, all that stuff. I do not, as a fire chief, I do not want to have to go through that again. I know just over the line a few years back, um, one of the Westport, it was, again, it was a chimney fire, fell off the roof, ended his career. He's lucky to be alive this day. I don't, I don't want to be put in that position. I would like the equipment that best suits us to do our job to make it safe as possible. So I'll end with that. I appreciate it. So Madam President, and I know we'll talk about this again later, but the it's talking about the rescue building at some point, again, when we get the fee structure, the first $600,000 is embedded into the budget, but really at some point we should look at everything over 600 should be earmarked for equipment replacement in the fire department. But that's a, a, a thought for another day, but it does help buy these pieces of equipment. That is a huge another subject that uh, will, will bring us some controversy. No, I know, but that's... Right. <laughs> Donna, um, I, I, I want to move on, but did you have your hand up? Um, yeah, I. if we're going to talk, I, I wanted to know if we could continue this for a, a, another meeting because... There's an awful lot to talk about, and it's now also 11.30. Well, I'm willing to stay another half hour to an hour if everybody else is. I mean, I planned on my morning being this, and um, if anybody can remember, there's been times our budget meetings have been all day on Saturday. Um, I purposely did this earlier rather than later because um, in the budget process in the past, we've been at the right deadline where we had a send this to the town administrator and the night before we were scrambling to try to um, finish it. So that's why I put these two departments together on a Saturday because I figure a Saturday is not like at night where we're going into 11, 12 o'clock midnight. Um, right. But Donna, if you have to go, that's fine. Um, well, I just, I, we're not going to do any votes. So. No, but there was one, if you don't mind, um, as far as the, uh, we're looking at the department salary. Uh, yeah, I, I know I'm going to. All right. Um, if we're going to go into that, we will. I'm going to stop with capital. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, Donna, go ahead. You can ask Bruce a question about salary. All right. Well, it, it's more of a, a, a general uh, a question um, that has to do with um, the educational requirements for the chief. Um, and that's contractual, if I remember. Well, no, it, it's really in the con, it's really in the charter. And I'm thinking that, uh, some of the problems that, uh, maybe Bruce is running into, may I call you Bruce? Sure. sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, that the, Donna, the which which, to, which um, line item are you actually looking at? Okay, I'm looking at um, 290, 291, 292. Okay. Okay. Um, I was I was thinking that I wanted to make a motion to continue on on those three things uh, due to the fact that. It really is contractual that it should be negotiated. And we don't know what the outcome's gonna be on that or what the cost is going to be. And there's give and take in negotiations. And this is um, kind of a give without a take. And I would like to be able to uh, 
you know, kind of talked to the, the labor lawyer, Tim Cavazza on, on this, because going forward, um, there's a lot being changed here without any contractual changes to opening the contract. And I'm getting a little concerned about that. We're adding uh, two yeah. rotator positions, uh, uh, chiefs con ed development, uh, deputy chief. Um, it's, it, this is like really serious. And I really think we need to need to ask Tim about, you know, what's going forward with this because it is contractual. One of the, the other thing I'm thinking is that we also need an amendment right away for the charter to take all uh, job requirements out of there because it doesn't leave you enough, enough leeway yeah. to, to hire uh, Chief, uh, Chief Rimals out of the ranks and then burden him with getting an associate's degree. Frankly, I don't think an associate's degree is bringing anything to the table that Bruce isn't already offering. He's doing a fine job in my opinion. I don't think him learning about Nubian history or Shakespeare or whatever goes on with his associate's degree is going to help him do his job. And I'm asking that we waive the requirement for an associate's degree and move for an amendment for the charter so that we can okay, well, not that, that's going taking a whole course. Donna, I think you're going off. I, I, I think it's random. I, I think it's kind of random, an arbitrary requirement for a to have a bottom line to hire people. And I don't think it's I don't think it should be required. All right. So I think we're going a little off topic, but um, Chris and uh, Bruce, the chief con ed development, was, was that included in the contract? His contract? Yes. Okay. So that's already been negotiated with Bruce. Um, that to be I know, but we can it can be renegotiated. I, all I'm trying to say, Denise. Yeah. Is yeah Madam that, President, I think we're going way off. What yeah, we're here Donna, for. you need we're to. We're not here to talk well, about contracts. I don't think so because it's with it's Donna. within that. I'm going to have to stop you from talking for just a moment. Um, negotiations are with the men, not with the chief. We already negotiated with the chief that three thousand dollars. I just want to make that clear. As far as the deputy chief and the rotative firefighters, I do have to agree with you that this is more a contractual issue that we will have to talk with the union on because that deputy chief, we we have to figure out if that's going to be part of the union, if that and and if that's going to be somebody in the union that we're promoting. Yeah, those two line items um will are part of the contract. I do agree with that. Um Bruce can give us a brief summary on why he wants that because it will help those of us that go into contracts with the knowledge of why he wants that. Um, but uh, but as far as taking things out of the um, charter, you can put that on as a, um, as a meeting agenda item on a regular meeting agenda item and we can discuss it there. And um, I definitely are, are supportive of that, but I think that's another meeting. Um, All so right. Okay. I'll, I'll Does that fair? Okay. Now, Bruce, um, I'm, I'm going to let you just tell us about this budget, and then we can ask questions. Okay. Okay. And I will, um, out of respect for Councilor Cook, I'm, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. No, um, it's all right, Bruce. Take your time. Okay. So, um, since we're talking about um, 290 and 291 line item, um, the deputy chief and the rotate two rotators. The deputy chief, I'll, I'll start with the deputy chief. Um, that position would be out of the union. It wouldn't have anything to do with the union. You know, it wouldn't be under the union contract. Um, the reason why I'm asking for that is to help manage the fire department, um, the day-to-day -day operations. Um, this person would certainly be out of the con be out of the union. Like I said, if I, 
if when I'm not here for any amount of time, this person would be able to take over. We wouldn't have to get somebody from the, the rank and file um, to step up and then pay all kinds of differential and then pay overtime to fill that position. Just, you know, like we have in the past, um, this person would certainly be able to step in and take over for me if I'm away for any amount of time, anything over three days, we have to, um, I have to put somebody in that acting position. Um, this, this person would oversee all the different um, departments, the train in the, within the department um, would help with the training, coordinate training with the four different shifts, um, would be going over reports that the, that the company officers are doing before they get submitted to the state um it's just there's so much that this person would help me do be doing um i i can't sit here and tell you everything because there's just so much with what i'm doing right now as the fire chief and the ema director it's the amount of work is just it's insurmountable i i can't certainly can't do it all right now trust me when i say this i'm doing the best that i can for for sure, um, and we're plugging along. I think this department could certainly, with that extra administrative position, could certainly be even better. Um, and it's not, you know, it's with the EMA, the whole um, EMA director thing, that's, it's not just because it's COVID, that part of this position has been put on to a great extent, not 100%, but on the back burner because the position of the fire chief is is a full-time position and then you take another head of something in this case the ema um Tiverton ema um in right especially right now that could be a full-time with with the the trainings that we got to go to to training the staff to preparing for any, any vaccines, um, clinics or anything like that to testing. We just did a testing, which I'd like to, uh, well, I got, yeah, yeah we, we did the testing um, site last weekend um, with the help of some volunteers and also some, um, a lot of the on duty guys. And we did a fantastic, they did a fantastic job. Um, we did almost 200 um, tests that, that day. And, you know, it's things like that that the EMA director is in charge of and is charged with coordinating. And it's just, it's two full-time jobs that this position requires. And with that, with a deputy chief, that I think that the two positions would be, I could do a better job with both. So again, out of the union, I know that was just mentioned, certainly out of the union, um, filling for me when I'm not here, etc. cetera. Um, as far as the rotators, that is, I understand your concern about, you know, that those positions obviously would, would be in the contract, the union contract. The reason, the biggest reason why I'm asking for them is because of there's um, legislation that got put into effect a year and a half ago or so. Um, that states the hours worked by all fire department members, anything over 42 a week would be time and a half with the schedule that we have right now, they're working 48 hours a week. So if we stay with this, the seven man minimum with the extra, with the extra guy, it's going to keep them on a 48 hour work week. We are going to be required by the new legislation that got put in effect whenever we a year and a half ago, whenever it was to pay each member six hours of overtime a week, that's 12 hours every pay period doing the, doing the quick math um, with the average amount of overtime, obviously a captain's rate of overtime pay is more than a first, a first class firefighter, which is more than a third class firefighter, et cetera. So using the, the median um, pay hourly pay, it's, well over 300, $325,000, $327,000 a year that we would have to pay them in overtime. And that's just for their regular shifts. 
we're paying time and a half now, correct? For yeah, some of this? Over 48. Yeah, for over 48. Over 48, right, right. Right, okay. So, so we, have, we have a seven man minimum here in town. Obviously, there's that there's um, the, the thing in the contract that says if we spend over the two thousand, it drops down to six. But we have a seven man minimum, which is what we have on staff plus that extra guy. That the, when he comes back, every firefighter in town comes back and does an extra twenty four hour shift a month. He is the eighth person on shift. If there's anybody out for any reason, vacation sick uh any reason that eighth person fills in that seventh seven man spot which allows us to stay at the seven man if there's more than two more than one person out on a particular shift we drop down in with the new legislation like i said that came out there's one or two things we can either pay the six hours or uh a week for every firefighter or 12 hours per pay period with, you know, to a sum of over well over $300,000. And that's with, that's not even covering any vacancies or we can try what I'm trying to do is try to start to fill that gap. Now, if we had four extra firefighters to the ranks to make it a 32 man department, like we had prior to the, um, the change in schedule back in 15, we already have that eighth man that can step in. Um, my, my idea is to hire two this year. They would be rotators. I'm calling them rotator firefighters, which we used to have in the past. We used to have one, how it would work is they sit down with the chief on, on a monthly basis, figure out where the vacation time is for the upcoming month or any vacancies in that the chief would put them in those positions, the two in those positions for 42 hours in that, in that week to stop any overtime. Instead of paying somebody overtime, it would be two regular time uh, firefighters to fill those. And then the following year, hire two more. That would give us the eight man shifts like we have now but they wouldn't be coming back on overtime. So, so I'm trying to, in two years, we're going to have to do something to, to deal with the new legislation. And I'm trying to do it a little bit at a time, as opposed to at the end of this contract, when the town's required to do something and just say, well, I need four firefighters, or you're going to pay 330, you know, 20, $30,000 just in, in regular duty that that that's why I, I understand that it is a contractual thing it would be put into the contract I'm, I'm trying to soften the blow if you will to the town all at once in a year and a half from now from now when this contract is uh expires and the town is required by law to to pay overtime for anything over 42 hours my question is uh, so this contract isn't going to come up for another year right Okay. The contract that we're in right, well, the, the contract that um, 17, 1703 is in right now still has a year and a half before it. So we believe at the end of FY 2022, he's going to have to have, in order to meet the contractual arrangements that the state did by change of the law, he's going to need four more staff. So putting two in now helps alleviate some of that blow that's all going to come at once. All right. My question is, when is this legislation? Um... It's, it's active now. So right now we're paying this over time. No, we're not because they, they signed their contract prior to the legislation. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So once this contract is over, it doesn't matter. You're going to be bound by the state law that you're so, not going to be able to do what they're doing now. This contract, the, the, where the town is kind of grandfathered in, if you will, with this contract. Yep. I get it now. Was, because it was signed before the legislation got enacted. Okay, I get it now. I see people with their hands up. Um, Jay, I think you were first. <clears throat> so Bruce, these are, right now it's two, but you intend it to become four. So the, the request, that would be, we'll just talk to two. That would be 
two full-time people with benefits and their real purpose in life will be to fill in and, and deal with the overtime issue. That's correct. Right, okay. Dan. And then we'd get two more and that would get you to the point. Now, I hope none, nobody sitting here today thinks that this will absolutely remove all overtime because anybody who's had to deal with scheduling and available personnel and that, no, it just is not possible. Right, so, and I also want to say, and Bruce did bring this up, we do have a huge problem with overtime. And we talked about this at the last negotiations. And Josh, you kind of suggested something like this at the last negotiations, if I remember, as a rotator. Um, I did. This also, and Josh gave me some nice little graphs to show me this one time. Um, this also I still helped. have them. <laughs> oh, good, because I think everybody would understand it better if they saw what I saw. Um, this helps with vacation time, too, right. mm -hmm. because if you have two people out on vacation, you're <laughs> paying overtime. There, there is no way that that you can't be. So we have talked about this as a solution for overtime in the past, because having these rotators really will reduce overtime. And it's not only the legislation. It's sick. It's people who are out on leave. It's people, I, I mean, I could give you a hundred examples because I've been through all of this. So these rotators were suggested at one point, I think it was either the last negotiation or two years or three years prior to that. But, well, yeah, I agree, Denise. Um, to me, I always used to call vacation time built in overtime. Right. Okay. But this helps. It is, but so if, if if ultimately we do end up having four rotators, all right, that, that'll cost us like $250,000 a year. Whereas, as Bruce said, overtime, because of the new state legislation and the fact that our new contracts will no longer be got, grandfathered and will re be required to conform to that, uh, we could save 100000 we could save, um, I mean, just if you look at what we spend on overtime now, we could save almost half of that, I bet you, if we did this right. more effic right. efficiently. Because there's built, you're right, Jay, there's built in overtime in all these contracts. You can't avoid it. No, you can't. But there, there is a way to make it less. And sometimes oh. we haven't been that smart trying to do it because we look at the price tag and we're not thinking of the reduction on the other side. Um, so, Deb, you have your hand up. I think this is a great idea. Thank you, Chief, for being so proactive. Um, my question is, that figure, that includes hiring two people, and that's um, salary and benefits? Okay. And... Does that figure change if we hire someone with more experience? So that that 118, that is the that is salary. That would be the salary for two um, for two firefighters. So what I did is because the town has allowed the, the fire department allowed me to hire laterals. Um, which is an, a person, a firefighter from another department that ha that's already trained, has the experience, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, bring them into the department at the rate of pay that's that they're coming from, you know, Correct. whether whether it be up to a first class firefighter. If, if I'm bringing a lieutenant in, which I just recently did from another department, he's not getting lieutenant's pay, but he, we're giving him first class pay, obviously, because, um, because of his experience time on the job, knowledge and all that. Um, so I, when I, when we did this, figured this out, we came in at a first class rate because again, saving money for the town, bringing somebody in, even though you're paying them a, um, a higher rate, hourly rate, we don't have to send them to the academy to get trained. We're, you know, right. we're saving all that money and it's worth, you can't expect somebody from another department to come over that's already been on the job there for 10, 12 years or whatever, and has a certain amount of um, weekly pay to come in at a probationary pay because 
they wouldn't be able to live. They can't, they, they can't exactly. live. Them. So would it change? It, it could change. Um, I think it would go down if anything, I, I can't imagine it going up because again, if we bring somebody over from say a lateral, you know, I'm paying, if I bring them in at first class pay that they're not going to go. I'm not going to bring them in at, at a offices rate if they were an officer or something. So. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Um, so obviously this is not contractual not <laughs> because our contract is not over. So this is just whether or not we want to be proactive in this and it will save us. And I believe this will save us money in the vacation overtime that we're spending and the sick overtime we're spending and also on any leaves that sometimes take six months and we're paying overtime to replace these guys. Um, all right, so any other questions? Cause I, I was gonna move on cause the rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. Yes. And what I, I did notice that the only really new thing is the state mandated EMT training. Is that correct, Bruce? Um, yes, I, that is certainly in there. I believe that's the only other thing. And I, can I, I, Madam Go President, I'd just like to say real quick about the last, about the rotators. Um, I don't, I believe, I've heard built-in overtime. There's overtime in the budget, obviously. I don't believe there's any built-in, anything into the, uh, into the schedule for the guys. There's no built-in overtime for the schedule. With that being said, after this contract, it expires in a year and a half. That's when I believe there will be built-in overtime because it's built-in overtime is just, in my opinion, when you when people say that it's they're getting overtime for working overtime dollars for working their regular hours, and that's what's going to be happening if we don't do anything about this. So, um, I just wanted to say that real quick. Thank <laughs> so you. So mandated EMT recertifications. Um, and also, that's right, the mandated um, apparatus, NFPA apparatus inspections are two items, new items. Okay. You, you want to talk on those? Yep. Yep. So the uh, mandated EMT recertifications, it's every two years, um, the EMTs, which is everybody in the department, whether they be a cardiac or a paramedic, they're all EM, emergency medical technicians. Um, they have to recertify through the, through the state and through the um, federally also. We have contacted and made arrangements with a company um, to help us with these certification, recertifications, I should say, um, to a sum of approximately $7,500. It's something that has to be done. Our guys are required to be EMTs. Um, that's always in the past been taken out of wherever we could to, to get them to, to get the money to pay for these. And this is, I, I think it's a, it's mandated that the town requires that, that they be EMTs, which I wholeheartedly agree with. They should be because like somebody mentioned before rescue is a lot of what we do now. Um, it's just money that needs to be that we need to get our guys recertified every other year. Bruce, my um, question is, um, we don't really have EMT. Well, we have cardiacs and paramedics. Um, right. Is this part of that renewal for them as paramedics and, and, and cardiacs? That's exactly what this is. So so okay. I think what, what, you're, what you're saying, if you just say an EMT, I think you're thinking of a basic EMT all levels of emergency medical care outside of the the hospital setting are EMTs, are emergency medical technicians. Okay. It's just it's the level of cardiac is a level of that. Paramedic is a level of that. A basic EMT is a level of that. They're just yeah. I just wanted to make it clear we do not have basic EMTs. That's which correct. I think that we should take pride in that because mo we have a lot of paramedics and that is the safety of this town is paramedics. They can do 
what <laughs> hospitals do out on the field. And that's very important, especially if someone's in cardiac arrest. Um, time time sa saves them. So um, I just wanted to make that clear that we have a very well-trained fire department um, and we're very fortunate we do. And that's because of um, our dedication to what to who we want to hire and what we're paying for. So, um, Absol absolutely. We, uh, our department is well respected in the area um, for our level of um, EMT certification and the care that we give. It's well known that Tiverton is a very well. If you're going to get sick, getting sick in Tiverton is not a bad place to do it. Yeah, it's a good uh, place to, to, um, <laughs> to get sick right now. I agree. <laughs> right, All so right. Any questions about this line item? Um, I think we've been paying for this. It's it's just we've been transferring funds to pay for this. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That is correct. So it's not really new. It's just something that we've been um, transferring. Um, Donna had her hand up. Yeah, I I I I think I was out of the room for uh, asking a question once again on on having having Tim help us uh, with the numbers and where this is going for the contract with the two extra rotators. And uh, I, I really think we should we should have him opine on anything that goes in the contract going forward. Sure, and Chris can always consult That's with him on, on this. But um, I've been in many conversations with contracts with Tim. He's quite aware of the overtime. He's quite aware of our concerns. So um, he's pretty knowledgeable on this and we can always check with him. Um, good suggestion, Donna. Um, okay, Bruce, do you wanna, anyone else have their hand up? I didn't see, no. Okay, go ahead, Bruce, uh, next new one. Um, the, the, I believe the next in final, I believe, um, is the men is the NFPA. And I use that word mandated again, um, NFPA apparatus inspections. So the NFPA is the governing body that, that we, um, go by for all, almost all of the things that we do, whether it be apparatus, whether it be training, whether it be, um, procedures that we use on the fire ground, et cetera, um, it is mandated by NFPA that our apparatus have annual inspections, um, annual NFPA inspections, which is a little, they're a little bit more detailed than just a regular run of the mill DOT inspection, um, which I wholeheartedly agree with. I think, you know, these are extremely heavy machinery, uh, pieces of machines that we, or vehicles, I should say, that we're, we're driving around town in order to have them as safe as possible for, for the guys, again, for the for my firefighters and for the general public, they should be scrutinized at least annually to make sure by a certified mechanic to make sure that they're as safe as possible driving the roadways of Tiverton. So um, it's not anything that we've done in the past. It's something that I've, I'd like to implement and start this year. I think it's a... Uh, it's a safety concern. It's an it's a liability concern for the town. I don't want to see us. We this town has gotten into a predicament in the past with unsafe fire apparatus, getting into an accident, severely injuring somebody, and and we we've paid for it rightfully so. Um, I will say rightfully so. We and we've had to pay for it. I'm I'm trying to stop that from happening again. Thank you, Bruce. Any questions regarding that? All right. Is there anything else you want to add, Bruce? Um, no, I just like to um, thank everybody for listening. If you certainly, if you have any questions, um, you can call Chris. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> um, you, can, you can certainly um, talk to the administrator. Um, I, I, my line's always open. If you have a sp specific question that he can't answer, I, I don't mind answering any questions. Um, and I, I'll, I'll sit down and, and ple plead my case as many times as I need to. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to ask you to prioritize your capital since you only have two. Uh, so um, I, You know what my priorities yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, so we'll go from there. 
Um, so I, I want to thank the department heads for participating. I know this is a Saturday morning, but we did. I feel that we got a lot done. Mm -hmm. So we educated a lot of us. We will come back to these line items and decide um, at some point. Um, so thank you. Now, Joan and uh, Chris are going to laugh at me because we did. I keep asking when we're going to have the next meeting. You gave me a date, and I don't know where I'm writing this down. I believe I have February 2nd. Okay. All right. So February 2nd at seven o'clock, it's on a Tuesday. Is that okay with all of you? It is an off. Um, I don't believe it's a town council meeting. So it's an off week for the town council. So it'll be that it, I won't say it's going to be our only meeting um, in case I have to do something else, but it's February 2nd at seven o'clock. Okay. With you. Yeah. Everyone. I think you want to do DPW is what you want. And to I do. want to do DPW. Um, DPW is a long one because um, Rick will be doing his. He'll also be doing the landfill and, and the other departments he's in charge of. So that'll take a couple of hours. Um, so is there any questions regarding that? Is that okay with all the members? That's fine. That's okay. Good. That's fine. Okay. Um, and Joan will advertise it the same way as a possible vote meeting. And I do that on purpose, just in case at some point we decide we want to take votes on something. All right. Well, thank you all for spending your Saturday morning with us. And um, I'll see you all Monday next Motion week. Motion to Saturday. adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Um, do I have a second? Second. Motion. And Bruce, you can't vote, but I appreciate you doing that. <laughs> uh, so motion's been made and second. We can all do this at, at um, raising our hands. Okay, you need up oh, here comes.